local, late breaking. This is a special edition of WBAL TV 11 News, the trial of Officer Porter. The case will soon be in the hands of a jury. And for the first time since the death of Freddie Gray, we hear from one of the Baltimore police officers himself. His account of what happened last April as week two of the trial of Officer William Porter comes to a close. A good evening, everybody. I'm Stan Stovall. And I'm Deborah Wiener. Officer Porter is the first of six police officers to go on trial, charged in connection to the death of Freddie Gray. Gray died of a spinal injury after a ride in a police van last April. Earlier today, the defense rested its case after calling 12 witnesses over three days, including Officer William Porter, his mother, along with other character witnesses, testified today that Porter is an honest and peaceful person. The state rested its case Tuesday. Prosecutors called 16 witnesses over five days. Jurors also watched Officer Porter's videotaped interview with Baltimore police detectives. Prosecutors contend that Porter should be held partially responsible for Gray's death because he did not place a seatbelt on Freddie Gray or get him treatment when Gray asked for help. Defense attorneys have suggested that the van driver was responsible for Gray's safety and Porter acted the way any reasonable officer would have. Porter's attorneys tried to unravel the connection prosecutors made between Gray's injuries and the officer's role in the police van ride. Defense attorneys called a nationally recognized forensic pathologist as their first witness. Dr. Vincent DeMeo says he disagrees with the autopsy findings. Dr. Carol Allen, the assistant state medical examiner who conducted Freddie Gray's autopsy, wrote that Freddie Gray died from a neck injury and the manner of death is homicide. But Dr. DeMeo testified the manner of death was an accident, not homicide. He also claims the injury happened between stops five and six of a van ride. Allen wrote in the autopsy report that Gray's injuries happen either when the police wagon rapidly accelerated or decelerated between stops two and four. On cross-examination, DeMeo conceded that Gray's death could have been prevented if he was wearing a seat belt. Legal expert Dwight Pettit says that could prove problematic for the defense. That's a very heavy uh, uh, portion of his statement uh, for the uh, state because if he's saying that uh, upon the discovery if, if Porter had acted, uh, then his life could have been saved, corroborates what, as I understand, what the two experts for the state concluded. But the defense did get Dr. Allen to admit that she would not have ruled Freddie Gray's death a homicide if the police van driver had taken Gray to the hospital, as Officer William Porter suggested. And a neurosurgeon who testified on behalf of Officer Porter said Gray's injuries would have immediately paralyzed him, making him unable to breathe and ask for help. Dr. Matthew Amerman also believes that faster medical care for Gray would not have saved his life. Current and former members of the Baltimore Police Department were also called to the witness stand on behalf of the defense. Former city police colonel and current Charlottesville, Virginia police chief Timothy Longo testified that Officer Porter did almost all he could do on the day of Freddie Gray's arrest. Longo told the jury Porter's actions were objectively reasonable. Under cross-examination, Prosecutor Michael Schatzow pressed Longo on the purpose of general orders and why police are expected to follow them. Michael Schatzow. Isn't the purpose to guide and mandate the discretion of the officers? Timothy Longo, everything a police officer does is based on what is objectively reasonable under the circumstances at the time. Longo explained, despite the amended seatbelt policy requiring seatbelt use, the revision doesn't take away an officer's discretion. For several days, Officer William Porter watched as witnesses took their turns on the stand. Wednesday morning, Porter testified. 11 News I team reporter David Collins joins us live from Courthouse East with what Porter had to say. David? Well, Deborah, William Porter taking the stand and early surprises a lot of people, but there's nothing conventional about this trial. Porter told the jury that he and Freddie Gray were not friends but had mutual respect, and he was traumatized by what happened to him. William Porter took the stand at his own defense. In a loud, clear, and authoritative voice, he sounded like someone confident they did nothing wrong. Well, I think Porter has done well in uh, connecting to the jury and giving the jury a sense of what it's like to be in Western District, um, that he was a new officer, two and a half years on the force, but he was a caring person. Defense attorney Gary Proctor, barely speaking above a whisper because of an illness, didn't pull any punches. Proctor, why didn't you call for a medic? Porter. 
I didn't call for a medic because after talking to Freddie Gray, he was unable to give me a reason for a medical emergency. I saw no external injuries. Proctor, why didn't you seatbelt him? Porter, where my gun is holstered makes doing that unsafe. I have never seatbelted a detainee. Prosecutors argue that Porter is responsible for Gray's death because he didn't buckle him or get medical attention when Gray asked for it, a violation of police general orders. Porter told the jury the police van driver is responsible for the safety of detainees. Proctor, did Freddie Gray tell you he couldn't breathe? Porter, absolutely not. I heard him say that when he was first arrested. He told arresting officers I can't breathe. I need an asthma inhaler. And he said something about his legs. Prosecutors believe Gray got hurt sometime between the second and fourth stop of the police wagon. Prosecutors contend at Dolphin and Druid Hill is where Gray asked Porter for help. Porter, Gray had a regular tone of voice when he talked to me. Proctor, what did Mr. Gray say? Porter, I offered, do you want to go to the hospital? And he said yes. I told the van driver, Caesar Goodson, the guy's asking to go to the hospital. There's no way he'll pass muster at Central Booking. I suggested to Goodson, take him to Bon Secours or a hospital. Proctor, who was responsible for the prisoner's safety? Porter, we never transferred custody. Officer Goodson has custody. But cross-examination exposed numerous inconsistencies in statements Porter made to investigators and those to the jury. To think of cross-examination as a search for the truth. That's when the truth is revealed. The prosecution challenged Porter's claim that he didn't seatbelt gray because of the position of his gun makes doing that unsafe. Michael Schatzow, why didn't you hand Officer Goodson your gun? William Porter, that's ridiculous. I wouldn't hand over my gun to anyone. Another testy exchange came when the prosecution challenged Porter to be more forthcoming with his answers regarding his co-defendants. Schatzow, is there a stop snitching culture in the police department? Porter, no, I'm offended that you would say something like that. A handful of supporters have been attending the trial daily. Some of them have been giving Porter hugs. On Monday, we're going to have closing arguments. Then followed by that, the jury, the fate of William Porter, will then be in the hands of a jury. Reporting live from Courthouse East, David Collins, WBIL TV 11 News. All right, David, thank you. Now, during this trial, we have heard both sides talk about the police van ride after Freddie Gray's arrest. We want to take you step by step on the stops that happened on April 12th last year. At 839 that morning, police make contact with Gray, who flees unprovoked. That happened in the 1600 block of West North Avenue. Minutes later, Freddie Gray is apprehended <coughs> and put inside the police van at Presbury Street. At 846, police stopped the van at Baker and North Mount Street to put leg shackles on Gray. The next stop is at the corner of North Fremont Avenue and Mosher Street. At 859, the van stops at Druid Hill Avenue and Dolphin Street. The van stops and police pick up Gray from the floor of the van and place him back in the seat. At 911 a.m., the van responds to an unrelated incident and puts a second prisoner, Dante Allen, in the van. That happened at West North Avenue and Pennsylvania Avenue. Now, after that stop at 924 AM, the van with Freddie Gray and Allen arrive at the Western District Police Station where a medic is called for Gray. All right, let's sort out some of the key moments during this week's proceedings. Joining me now to discuss the trial is legal analyst Professor Doug Colbert with the University of Maryland Carey School of Law. He's been in the courtroom since the very start. Doug, thanks for joining us again. And let me start here. A significant moment in this trial occurred when Officer Porter testified in his own defense. Do you think his testimony helped his case? It certainly helped his case because he was able to humanize himself before the jury. And overall, he left a favorable impression with the jury. But he really had no choice, Dan, but to testify. He had given previous statements to two detectives five days after Freddie Gray was brought to the hospital. And those statements needed explanation because the description he gave of Freddie Gray's condition uh, was a serious condition and he needed to explain that. He also needed to explain why he didn't seatbelt uh, Freddie Gray and why he didn't take him for medical treatment. The prosecution and the defense have both rested now. So what do you think is the central point jurors will have to weigh once they deliberate? Well, they're going to have to look at the inconsistencies that uh, Officer Porter left the jury with. Will they accept his trial testimony or will they look back to the statements he made initially? In addition to that, he's going to have to Officer Porter is going to have to convince the jury 
that he truly was in danger, and that's the reason why he didn't seatbelt Gray. Now, the problem with that, Stan, is that uh, Officer Porter did enter the van, and he lifted uh, Freddie Gray up. He was only inches away from him, and then he placed him on a bench that was there. The question becomes, if he wasn't in danger when he did that, then why would he have been in danger not to be able to seatbelt Freddie Gray? Yeah, the prosecution, of course, rested first. What do you think has been its strongest argument in this trial? Well, the strongest argument that the prosecution's relying on here are those of their three experts. And the third doctor, Dr. Lehman, was particularly impressive because he talked about um, a shared responsibility, that it wasn't just Officer Goodson, who was the driver of the van, who had responsibility for Freddie Gray, but it was also Officer Porter when he examined him. And Dr. Lehman, in addition to the other two doctors, Dr. Soriano and our medical examiner, um, uh, were able to center the injury between the second and the fourth stop. So their testimony was quite impressive. Yeah, and conversely, the defense's strongest argument. Well, the defense is also going to rely on their client, uh, the defendant, uh, Officer Porter, if he's able to convince the jury to accept his trial testimony, uh, he's likely to be found not guilty. Um, but they're also going to use their experts to say, you see, the experts all disagree. So if they disagree, surely that's a reasonable doubt. All right. Legal analyst Douglas Colbert, thanks again for your time. Deborah? You're welcome. Stan, again, here's a look at some of the key points from the state's case. Prosecutors argued that Porter knew the rules and ignored them. State witnesses testified that officers, per Baltimore police policy, are required to seek medical attention for detainees if they need medical assistance and to secure a detainee in a seatbelt. The state also alleges that Porter did not call an ambulance after Freddie Gray said that he could not breathe. Porter testified that Gray never said he was having trouble breathing. And prosecutors say Porter could have saved Gray's life if a medic was called immediately. In a statement to investigators, Porter said medics don't come when officers are in possession of their own transport vans. The jury in this case now made up of seven women and five men. That is different from last week because on Monday a female juror was excused due to a medical emergency. She was replaced by alternate juror number one, a man. The jury is considering four charges against Porter, involuntary manslaughter, second degree assault, misconduct in office, and reckless endangerment. Porter has pleaded not guilty to the charges.